Okay, well, welcome back to Wonderlust and the search for Forest Sends Gold. It is a wonderful April spring day here on April 4th. Beautiful day outside. The sun's out. Uh, the birds are tweeting and it's a great day to think about uh, getting out and traveling around and looking for Forest Fan's treasure. I did a seven video series where I dissected and listened to the Forest Fan interview from the Moby Dick Moby Dicks in Santa Fe from twenty thirteen. I think it was the November interview. I don't want to overdo. Yeah, I don't want to overcook the aspects of that interview, but it is an interview that I keep going back to. I think after that interview, and uh, after that interview, in the ensuing interviews that Forrest Fenn does that are recorded and online, he definitely starts to become more guarded. I really feel that he does. I think the early 2013 interviews Forrest is selling the book. The Thrill of the Chase. And then after the book comes out in early 2013 and I think it may have come out earlier than that but it's only in 2013 and I might be wrong about this, that he really starts to promote The Thrill of the Chase. And he follows that book up with Too Far to Walk. My personal take on it is that, as he just divulges multiple times, is that The Thrill of the Chase, the income from that book, goes to, or 10% of it, was it 10 or 20%, goes to a charity... And I almost wonder if Too Far to Walk was an opportunity to capitalize on that in income. You can say what you want about that. I don't want to get into that. Going back to the November 2013 interview, and that's what this video I wanted to do was kind of freeform talk about some things, but also I kind of want to do summaries of those seven videos I did on that bookstore interview. So uh, I watched my own videos and took notes on those two, and I'm going to try and put this into some more videos and summarize the things that I heard and I noted were important. So kind of, I'm going to work backwards on this. I don't know, should I go from the top? Let's see. Let's see here. Uh, how can I do this? Okay, let's see. If I drag this out here on our beautiful scenery. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to copy and paste these things a couple at a time. So at the beginning of the interview, he starts out and he says, It's 1988. I was told I had cancer and was going to die. I was given a 1 in 5 chance or 20%. This is a, and had three years, was told to give three years to survive. It is true that a little bit later on in the interview, he said that he assumed he would only make it one year. And I might be reading too much into this, but I do find it interesting that in subsequent interviews, especially the first three interviews, and he does do that in the other interviews, I think there's a, there's a, a gap. From 2013, there are no interviews until almost 2015, and then none again until like 2017. He tends to open with this 1988 20% chance, three years to live narrative. The reason why I keep beating on that is I'm wondering, are these numbers important for some reason? I have my conclusions to be drawn from that, 
from the numbers. So he tends to open with this story. It could just be because that's the shtick. The interesting, the other part of it that, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit, is that in that interview, he continues to say, and he's done this before also, is he says that I invite you to go look for the treasure chest, and with my dying, gasping breath, I would throw myself on the chest and let my bones rot back to the earth. And then his punchline to that is, but then I got better, and I survived the cancer. By his own admission, and, and I'm not a doctor, and I don't have the records, and I really don't want to get into the details of it, but I mean, it sounds like he had an operation and he had some kind of internal organ partly removed or completely removed, and that... Was there was a tumor, or there was tumorous material, and it probably, and I'm guessing here, is that it was probably benign. So, but I guess if it happened to me, yeah, I'd be freaked out too. I, especially if they were saying, hey, you could be dead like in the next 365 days or less, or hey, you got three years, you, you might make it, may not. And then, but he tends to tell the story that way, and I get it, uh, you know, that that would leave anybody sort of paralyzed or definitely stressing out but he, the point is that he survived and he'll say the punchline he'll say I survived and I got better and it ruined the story and the reason why I point this out about that it ruined the story that he got better is that he's saying that it, there's like two different frames of reference here is he saying I thought I had cancer and I was going with my dying breath to throw my bones on this chest at this special spot and leave myself to go back to earth I don't want to be in a hospital I don't want to have all this stuff hooked up to me I just want to die peacefully in nature as God intended it but then I got better and it ruined the story and I th the conclusion that I'm drawing is that He's not actually going to go throw himself on that chest ever. And he never, maybe he did at one point when he was diagnosed with cancer in 1988, he actually considered doing that. That was something he was going to do. But that being said, and in regards to searchers looking for the treasure chest, an often used narrative of searchers is that the chest would not be somewhere where you would want to leave a rotting body, a human body, let alone any other carcass of a mammal, you know, like a cow or a pig. I mean, it's going to stink. It's terrible. But I'm saying that that's a foul. That's false. That... that every, anytime anybody says, well, it would be at this particular spot, and people would say, well, if I was, you know, at that particular spot in Yellowstone, at that venue, you know, where hundreds of thousands of people walk up to that venue, and they look out, and they see the waterfall, you know, someone would say, well, maybe it's 40 feet below that railing, and you walk up to the railing, and so people are saying, well, if you had a body down there, people are going to, it's going to stink like high hell, there's going to be buzzards, birds, other grizzly bears, all sorts of other carnivores coming around, pecking at that body. And I think that, and I'm making a, long, a lot out of this, is that I don't think he... That if you use that as a reason to negate a solve, I think you're making a mistake. So, I personally have that in my rule book of, I don't think, if you st and if you start using that as a parameter to cut out solves, I think you're causing yourself a lot of grief, and you may, may even have the solve. And you're saying, well, it wouldn't be that. It couldn't be in downtown Santa Fe. It couldn't be in a downtown area. Because of that reason, and I think that that is a mistake.
So with that being said, um, the next thing, the next thing that Forrest Fan says he's in this interview is he misspoke. Sp- he misspoke. He says that the box is ten by ten by six inches, which is he had said in earlier interviews that it's ten by ten by five inches. He also says that it may have held a Bible, that the chest could be Romanesque, 11th to 12th century. And then he goes into the spiel, and I didn't write it down exactly, but it, he hits 265 gold coins, American eagles, double eagles, has gold nuggets from Alaska. It has two large pieces of gold the size of chicken eggs or goose eggs or something, sapphires, diamonds, bracelets, the semi-precious stones. And I think he said some other stuff about bracelets in there. Fantastic. But it is interesting that he... I think this could be under the heading of the 10 by 10 by 6, 10 by 10 by 5 could fall under the heading of... And Forrest Van has told us this before, that he likes to drop wrong information and see if anybody corrects him on it or even notices that he did it. I think that's all that that is. It also just could be that he misspoke. I think the two more quick points to try and fit this into this video is that he says that the book has a poem and it has nine clues in it. If you follow the clues, you follow the clues to the treasure chest, you can have the treasure chest. Okay, when I hit the treasure chest, I took two trips because it was heavy, uh, because gold is heavy, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here what I wrote. It weighs 42 pounds. These are all just my notes from listening to my to the cuts of the video. He says, when I hit it, when I was walking back to the car, I laughed out loud. And he says to himself, Forrest, did you really do that? And the reason why I make note of this is because it is a contested and kind of very well-talked about thing is that he took two trips to hide the treasure at one spot, and he used his car. He used a car. He parked a car. That's the point. And the next thing is this part here. Let's see. The audience for the book is every redneck in Texas with a pickup truck, a wife and 12 kids who's lost his job. And then he goes on to say, why not throw your bedroll into the back, take the kids and look for the treasure. And he says, get the kids off the computers and little devices. And he makes a little fanism. He says, let the kids breathe the sunshine. So uh, I think that goes maybe up here with the 10 by 10 by 6. It's either just a Freudian slip of the tongue, and he says, breathe the fresh air, and he's saying, breathe the sunshine. Is there anything to that? Probably not. But it is interesting that he does a little quip again, and and nobody said, no, says anything, nobody notices it, nobody points it out. And he just continues on with what he's saying. Another thing, too, is that in previous interviews, he said, it's eight kids. You know, every redneck in Texas with a pickup truck, a wife, and eight kids. This time he says 12 kids. So apparently some, that also, I think, is another little Texas joke. So that when he did the interview before, it was eight kids. And so between when he did the last interview earlier in 2013 and now, you know, apparently this redneck has had four more kids. So that's, I think, kind of funny. Like, haha, Forrest, got it. Got the joke. So the thing that I find the most fascinating about these interviews is that he's providing hard information, but he also creates these little jokes and twists. But then is it actual information that is part of a clue? You know, like this 1988, one out of five, 20%, three years. Is that information that's going to help you solve the clues? All right, so that does it for this video. Uh, like my channel, and thanks for listening and watching, and tune back in again. Subscribe if you can, too.